what can you tell us about the book Fingerprints of the Gods? Oh, man. That was a game changer for me. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I really... Uh, that's Hancock, yeah. Uh, Graham Hancock is, is the author's name. Um, Fingerprints of the Gods was the first... Um, first book I was given as like a, I don't know, an early teen when I was starting to realize that maybe the stuff we weren't learning in school was, was the right stuff. Um, and so I kind of skimmed it over. I wasn't, you know, it really didn't stick with me like it should have. But, uh, you know, you're just taught that, that pyramids are built by slaves and, you know, that yeah. there were, there were tombs for the kings. And then this Graham Hancock book comes along and all of a sudden it's, no, these pyramids might be machines and there's no way that slaves could have built this stuff. And you're like, oh my God, this is a whole new world opening up. So just kind of, you know, that's supernatural, not even necessarily supernatural, but otherworldly stuff became of, of interest to me. How old were you when you had read that book? Um, well, I, I, I'll, I use read very loosely because okay. it was one of the things that like my father had that and he gave me Timothy Ferris, um, Four Hour Work Week? No, no, no. What the hell's the name of it? I can't remember the name of the Timothy Ferris book. Four Hour Body? No. <laughs> you know, fuck. I'll I'll Google it in the break. But Tim uh, Ferris is the shit. By yeah, way. he's great. But it was dude. just one of those things. I was like, all right, my dad wants me to read it. How good could it really be? So I was like, yeah, dad, I read the book. Just briefly skimmed the cursory glances. But uh, so fifteen maybe. Okay. But then I reread it. Like actually dove in just like two years ago. Oh, so it has a different takes on a different a meaning. whole different meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you've been pretty much into wanting to write novels since you were like 14. Yeah. That so, was my goal in okay. life. My first purpose of this is something I'm going to do was write a book. What were some of your favorite books growing up that you read? Um, I was like, you know, my dad was a really big reader. So in the house, it was always these things of like, if you want to play sports, you have to read these books. If you want to do this, you have to read the books. It was never like do your chores. It was always like read these books. Um, so he got me into some really interesting stuff when I was little, which is like Borges, uh, was a big, a, a big, um, author that, that he insisted I read. He liked a lot of the Argentinian writers for some reason. I don't know what he had, he had an affinity for, for writers from Argentina and got into a lot of those when I was really young. But I would say Borges was kind of the guy that was like, wow, this is like almost a fairy tale sort of style that I really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you kind of developed this this love for words early on. Yeah, it was very early, and I and I really liked the idea that um, authors could be really famous and rich, and you had no idea what they looked like. Yeah. like they were kind of like they could blend into the background. Like I didn't know what any of my favorite authors looked like, you know, mm -hmm. and I liked that because it kind of, and that's what music was to me too before. The internet, I didn't know what any of these singers looked like until you would go and buy the magazine. Be like, oh, that's the guy that sings for Nirvana. I had no idea what he looked like, you mm -hmm. know, because you couldn't find his picture on the layout. So discovering what these people were behind that was a big deal to me, and I liked that authors were always hidden. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So you kind of discovered music in a way through your love for words. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about, um, about that. I think that was, um, again, probably my father's doing, which was uh, the Beatles. I think that the way that they... You know, I mean, Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club Band, and, uh, you know, these were, these were, uh, these were books, you know, They're, these were audio books to me, every song was a story, and, uh, you know, I just, you know, reading the lyrics was like, oh my god, these are like tales, and these are, these are scenes out of a, out of a novel, and, um, yeah, I realized that, that it could be done. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, you were talking about Fingerprints of the Gods, and how you read it a couple years mm -hmm. ago, and it was totally different yeah. from when you read it when you were a kid. Um, how did you unravel your thinking, you know, the stuff that you get taught growing up when yeah. you realize that a lot of it's incorrect? Like, how did, what was the process for you? Um, I feel like there has to be some sort of main event in your life that really just turns that switch for you. Um, I, I know that a very long time ago, I was also given a book um, by Herman Hess, this, who's probably my favorite author now, but I was given Damien when I was about like 19 or 20, and I read it, and it just didn't make any sense. I didn't care. It was a story about a dude and his friend. I'm like, who cares about this story? Yeah. Um, but then I got into a point in my life where um, med I was turned on to meditation, and I started meditating, and that sort of opened the door down this different path of meeting these new people that were into meditation. It was just mm -hmm. sort of like a bonding thing. You had like, oh, yeah, I... I, I listen to this guy's lectures or I've watched his videos on YouTube or I've read his books and then I got handed the same Herman Hess book again and having been through meditation now I understood that this was a very transcendent story of um, 
you know, a, 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 a strength that I didn't realize when I was younger. So I think it has to be a very personal affair in order for you to have that switch flip. So that was kind of a thing when I realized that what I knew about reality and all this, this you know, this stuff that goes along with meditation is not necessarily what I had always thought it was. Fingerprints of the gods is, was kind of the like, well, also, history isn't necessarily what you think it, it might be. So mm-hmm. it was one of those kind of, yeah. And it's also people, the way they interpret the past. and Yeah, and use it that's all it. subjective. And, you, you know, you're just, oh, these are the facts. These are the facts. These are the facts. These are the facts. And then one day you realize facts don't really mean anything. Yeah. And then you go, well, what else, what else doesn't really mean anything? Oh, yeah, the story, the story of, of, of what happened, you know, this many years ago, or pr- the term prehistory is just an insane term. Like, prehistory, what, is, what does that mean? Like, this, this, the stuff you don't want to have to explain before the stuff happened that you do want to account for. And then, you know, you delve into prehistory, and it's all this, you unearth this whole new world. And there are a lot of discrepancy effects from the stuff that you learn in, like, in high school textbooks versus what actually happened. Like, there's a lot of omissions. Yeah, it's insane. Uh, a lot of omissions. That, um, yeah, when I was a kid and I was, like, into activism, um, you know, there was this book called, like, Lies Our Teachers Tell Us. And it mm-hmm. was just a, it was like a, it was like a textbook in negative space. It was, like, all the stuff, it was, like, set up like a textbook, but it was the truth about all the stories, the presidents that were horrible people and, you know, these, these American heroes that were horrible people and all of the backstories. You're like, wow, this is just awesome. These are all these things that I couldn't even have imagined before. And it was interesting to just start unraveling. Yeah, everything unravels. Have you read any of Paul Graham's stuff? No. Oh, dude, you should definitely check out Hackers and Painters. Okay. He's this dude. He's an essayist. He writes some really awesome okay, essays. Okay, cool. I think, I'll I'll check it out. Be into that. Absolutely. Um, but back to meditation. Um, so did you take up meditation... From being on the road all the time, or what led you to that? Um, yeah, it, it was it was from being on the road all the time, and there's only a, uh, there's only so much that drinking can do for you, you know. To be honest, and it was really the same sort of. It, initially, it was the same sort of selfish escapism of like I, I'm not happy with this. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna drink a lot. That was always the the solution. I'm not happy. I'm drinking until so, I met somebody that was like, Oh, you're not happy. Meditate. I'm like, Why would I do that when I could just drink? You know, why do I sit there in silence when I can go fucking crazy with my friends? And he's like, that's a different kind of happiness. And so I was like, I, because I'm just kind of a person that does all or nothing, I went, I went home and I took courses and I read and Whoa. I, yeah, like that, I tracked down a, a certified meditation teacher, I took, I studied under him for a few months and I really went full bore with it. And it was, un, it was awesome. Me as a person, that was like a new a new birth for me. It was awesome. Interesting. Yeah. We'll, we'll get back to new births later. Okay. Right? Sure. Uh, sorry. I, no, I that's okay. <laughs> um, wow. So can you give us a time period and when you started meditating and yeah. and when? You yeah, I think it was 2008, um, which I, 2008 was kind of the first inkling that I had, I should take it more seriously than I thought. I mean, I had always just sort of been like very dismissive of it. It was just like some hippie bullshit, you know, right. like, I thought the same thing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Everybody does, and it's unfortunate. Um, and then, you you know, later on you realize that that whole appearance is really kind of the, the point of it. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it does sort of deter you, but it, it, it requires people to, to look past that. Mm-hmm. And if you can look past that appearance, you do find this wealth of, of knowledge, that, this unspoken knowledge. But it's almost like it's set up like that. Like, here's a barrier. Only people that are really superficial are going to be deterred by it. And are you willing to look past that, you know? And that goes with, and then once you realize that that's what applies to meditation, that applies to everything in the universe. Like, Mm -hmm. here's how it looks. You're probably going to have these preconceived notions of it. And you can either be deterred by that or you can really get in. And I really got in and I was like, okay, I'm just going to suck it up. And I'm just going to deal with all these hippies. And I'm going to deal with everything that goes along with it. I know it's bad. I know it's stupid. I know I always made fun of it. But here we go. And then it was like, poof. I was like, wow. So... Uh, yeah, 2008 was when I really was like, all right, I'm going to do this. Okay. But early in my life, my mom had always kind of been into it. Mm-hmm. And I always saw she had like the Chopra novels around the house. And I was like, who is this fucking snake oil salesman, you know? But now it makes sense. And I hate that it makes sense because I'm like, <laughs> I was wrong for so long. So you're on the road a lot. And you are you have this newfound uh, love for meditation. And yeah. you're also writing. You wrote scale mostly on the road. Yeah, yeah. So does meditation help with your writing? 
Uh, yeah, but it doesn't, it, it's never a direct correlation. It's never okay. a, I meditate, I don't meditate and write. Then right. I go back to meditating. It's just this, meditation is just this thing that you do, and then it operates on this very molecular level while you're doing other stuff. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you realize that you have a thought you didn't have ever before. And then that spawns into something. And you never go, oh, cool, that's the, that's the thought that came from me meditating this morning. It just... Like I said, it's on, on a molecular level. You'll never realize the correlation between it, but it just provides this clarity that you know you typically don't get. And you typically, I mean, it's the clarity that I I clouded with alcohol. I see. Yeah. So there was a lot of work to be done, and there is so much work to be done still. And you know, I'm definitely not like a David Lynch guru of meditation, but I do see that the work has to be done. And I think that's a good first step for me because I was always like, I'm fine. I'm cool. I'm, I'm, I'm having fun. I'm living life. And I was like, yeah, there was a part of me knew that that was fucked up. That was yeah. wrong. So when I was reading scale, um, Ray Goldman, what I realized is a lot of what goes through in the book, it's like his hero's journey, you know, like you enter it's, this darkness and then you reemerge. It's a very archetypal hero's journey. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I, I have no problem saying that it is definitely a hero's journey. Sorry to cut you off. Oh, no, yeah, no, 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 I totally agree. It is this. Yeah, you go in and then you come out clutching fire, you know, or clutching this treasure. But I think that Ray, Ray's journey never resolves in him coming back with any knowledge. He's like about to get the, the brass ring and he's just like, Ugh. he's afraid of something or, yeah. you know, he gives up on something too quick. So it's always that like almost sort of thing. The hero's journey has three segments, which is... Uh, Departure, fulfillment, and return. Mm -hmm. And that's what every hero's journey typically has. Um, so I took out the, the fulfillment part of it. So I just, yeah. and, and I mean, with a tour, I, I really felt like in my own life, there was a lot of departure and return. You know what I mean? You're going, mm -hmm. I'm going on a tour. I'm always leaving something. I'm always coming back to it. So it becomes a cyclical thing. You had mentioned um, death and resurrections uh, earlier in our conversation, mm -hmm. which is, well... Uh, Ray doesn't necessarily have the resurrection, but in your life, what are some death and resurrections aside from what you just mentioned? That was a, a big one. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't want to get too personal or bring anything down, but I just, yeah, I, yeah. I had this really, you know, I, um, when my daughter was born she, just recently, she was born under very difficult circumstances right. that, that put her and my wife in a lot of danger, and uh, that I, I feel like I'm experiencing another thing. So I've stopped drinking completely, mm -hmm. and that's that's huge for me because I've never done that before, and I just feel like it's it's time to, to really, I I was able to to be shown this flash of like this could be really bad, like your life could be really bad, and it's not, yeah. and you know there, so there's really no mourning going on. It's I I'm extremely thankful. I'm more thankful than I have ever been for anything. The fact that that didn't go one more notch in the wrong direction. Because now I have everything back, but it was a, it was a, a brief period of real darkness for me. So, but here I am. Well, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Me too. Uh, do you feel that Ray swims against the current of life in, rather than going with it? Absolutely, absolutely. I think he he his struggle is really internal, um, and it it doesn't have to be that at all. You know, I, I and I feel like he's not reading the signs correctly. There are so many signs showing him like, go this way, go this way. This, here's this, here's this stepping stone. Take this, go on to the next step. And he's mm -hmm. like, he's too caught up in himself. He's the, I mean, he's a, a textbook egomaniac. You know, okay. he just, he's just so caught up in like my struggle. There's never been one like it. This is, all, I'm the only one that suffers like this. And, and then, you know, he realized, he, well, he doesn't realize, but he should realize that he's not the only one ever. And I hope the reader realizes that too. Well, you know, it's interesting in life. I think lots of people think they're special snowflakes. And yeah. It's, it's hard to break out of that. It is extremely hard. Mindset. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did you do that? Uh, or are you I still in the process? Kind of. of no. I, the thing is, it's, it's weird because it's such a, it's such a juxtaposition because no, you're not a special little snowflake, but you're so much more powerful than you think you are by being a part of something bigger. You know what I mean? I'm not a special snowflake, but I am a snowflake in this huge, you know, storm or whatever. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's really like a, a blood cell that, you know, needs to be a part of something bigger. So when you realize that there's not this duality of you versus them, 
people think that that's how they lose their individuality by saying, well, if I'm just everybody else, then what am I really, you know, but no, right. you're, that means you are everybody else. That means you're, you're infinitely bigger than you ever thought you were. Yeah. So it's, it's really, you have to take away all the power to get all the power. Sort of thing. The hero's journey. The hero's <laughs> journey. Yeah. So you've been, you, you had been writing lyrics for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and then you started writing scale. Mm -hmm. So did you find that things were domain specific, meaning that writing lyrics requires a different skill set than writing a book? Yeah. Um, I mean, in the obvious way of the music sets up these parameters and here's a frame, you can't write any longer than the song goes. Totally. I mean, you could, but then you'd be, it would, you'd be a spoken word guy. <laughs> and nobody, nobody wants to listen to that. But uh, yeah, I mean, so the timing was everything of how long are these chapters, how short are these chapters, you know, sort of things. I mean, there's... You know, there's a chapter in there that I think is only two or three pages, but it, you know, it, it just felt like it just, it is what it is. And if you're just kind of, once you kind of tune into where you need to be with the book, then you, these parameters do fall in line. It's like, okay, I said everything I need to say. I don't need to drown it in words. Mm -hmm. Do you find that there are parallels between the publishing biz and the music biz? Um, not necessarily... Uh, in bad ways. Um, I think there are in just the fact that, you know, there's going to be people that are initially a little cautious about it you know like a, when you start a new band like do am i supposed to like this yet everyone's kind of looking around like is this something we all agree on like are we cool with this are we not right. cool with this so i know everyone's a little tepid um at first but yeah i mean it's, it's funny to see like people like yeah, i don't I just don't i usually don't read books and i read your book and i really like it and it's like okay that's very cool you know mm -hmm. um uh, I, I i do think that there is a little less competition in so far that i've seen and I mean, I'm seriously like the. I'm like, in the literary world, I'm the band that plays before doors. Like, I am a nobody right now. I'm just, just trying to get my name out there. Um, but I do see that you know there. I feel like writers are willing to work with other writers a lot more fluidly than like uh, this is my territory. Get off my territory, sort of thing, which mm -hmm. I see with a lot of bands. Right. That's my experience, and I could totally be biting my tongue and eating my words in like a month. So. <laughs> um. So that brings up another question of, um, of criticism. So when you're in a band, you know, you, every time I die, it's kind of, it functions on its own. Uh -huh. And so you're off into this new territory of writing. Yeah. The criticism that you would receive for every time I die versus the criticism that you would receive writing your book mm -hmm. is, do you feel more vulnerable to one? Oh, yeah. How do you uh, deal with that? Yeah. I mean, yesterday I did this thing. Um, I had something at a bookstore in Long Island and... It was I was standing out there and it's like I don't have my guys there to like make noise if I'm if I have nothing to say like oh shit what do I do like okay that, you know with a band it's like not all the attention's on you because everyone is important you know so, uh, when you're in a band but yeah. when I'm just standing there I'm like oh shit this is just me but it's also a very it's a slow it's a very slow burn of the book um, and that was one of the really frustrating things is when you release music the race is to be who can write a review fastest who the, that's the race like at first i got it first i heard it first i'm reviewing it first this is my first opinion i haven't really devoured any of it i just first glance this is my this is what i think everybody read what i think it's exactly what i do yeah right. <laughs> but then with a book people are like oh wait i gotta re i'm gonna read it like two or three times and then i'll tell you what i think about it it's like whoa you're actually gonna take time with this like yeah that's crazy good awesome but wow well it takes like a week to read a book anyway. i know it's so, it's nuts nuts but interesting yeah so I want to, so younger people that are coming up, you know, mm -hmm. people are looking at you like, oh, Keith Buckley, the front man of every time I die. I'm sure you've gotten a lot of advice in your lifetime to get to where you are mm -hmm. in your career. Um, but what's some bad advice that people gave you that just in retrospect is just awful? Uh, I mean, you know, don't give up is an awful piece of advice because you uh -huh. should give up. There's a lot right. of things that you should, know, but the key is not, the key is not to just give up on everything. The key is to know what specifically to give up on and when to give up on it. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? You have to read those signs. You really have to just pay attention. Don't think that quitting is a bad thing ever. If something doesn't work, you stop doing it. Right. I mean, it went for me. I applied it to smoking cigarettes. I just applied it to alcohol. That just didn't work. George Carlin, that was a big thing of his, was like, listen, if a drug doesn't work for you anymore, you just stop doing the drug. He's like, totally. and that's always the way... He said, he said that that's always the way he had been. When a drug doesn't do for him anymore what he wanted to do in the first place, he stopped doing it. That's how you should treat everything. When it doesn't work, you, you should be constantly changing. And if it doesn't work for you, 
give up. It's okay. Well, well, how would you know? So, for instance, I wouldn't go try out. I, I couldn't be in the NBA. Yeah. You know? So, like, well, things you like know that. that. You're honest right. with yourself. You know? Sure. You have to be honest with yourself. I'm not, I am not a good painter. I'm not mm-hmm. a good illustrator like my brother. You know what I mean? I, yeah. Just because he's my brother doesn't mean that I should try to do the things he does. You know? I, I, I'm a terrible illustrator. And I know that. And I'm honest with myself. And, okay, so I'm going to focus my attention on something else. You know? <laughs> it's just how it goes.